are, March 11th, 2017, back, back, and could not be more excited, I've been waiting for this for a long time, and I am Gendy Tartakovsky, and with me is my wife. Dawn Tartakovsky. Dawn Tartakovsky. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, why is she here? Well, it's Saturday night, <laughs> and I'm pretty much working every other night, so this is our time together, and so here we are. Date night. <laughs> so why are we here tonight? Yes. So uh, it was 2015. I finished Hotel Transylvania 2, and I wasn't sure what I was going to do next. So I was taking job offers here and there, interviews and whatever. Nothing was exciting. And then uh, literally I was sitting on the toilet where all the great ideas come, and I thought maybe it's time to, do, to finish the Jack story. And I wrote an email to Rob Sorcher, who is the, who's the head of Cartoon Network. And I said, look, you know, I've been traveling around the world, and wherever I talk, whatever press I do, the first question always is, are you going to do a movie? Are you going to finish the story? And so I think it's time. Uh, he wrote me right back, says, I think that's a great idea, but you know, Adult Swim now starts at 8, and so it should be for Adult Swim. So the next day, Mike Lazo called me, who's my uh, boss from day one of Dexter. So we have a great relationship. And he said, uh, I think that's great. How many episodes and how much? And uh, after we worked that out, two weeks later, we started writing. And here we are. Here we are. Yeah. All right. Should we start the Q&A? Let's do it. All right. Um, <clears throat> let's see. OK, how did you enjoy making a more adult series? And what would you make more like in this future? You can put your glasses on. Too. I know, I need my glasses. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, I did enjoy it. I think the doing Jack, I mean, listen, from the day one, from, from Dexter even, we, did, we never did stuff for kids specifically. Like, we knew we couldn't do racy stuff and swear and all that stuff, obviously. But we, I don't know what an eight year old likes. I really don't even know what an adult likes. I like, I know what I like and what the crew likes. And so we always pitch our episodes, and that's how we gauge if it works or not. And so for adult, I just didn't have to think about anything. And of course, the whole violence of Jack was subdued to kill robots, so I knew for sure it's going to be more violent and blood and stuff. But we still wanted to do it stylistically, and um, that still fit in with the Jack style. Right. You know, We didn't want to go like Ninja Scroll on it all, all of a sudden. Right. All right. OK, con 10. Gendy, what new and old voice actors are in this season? Uh, of course, Phil Lamar is back as Samurai Jack. Um, you know, the big question was Mako, of course. You know, Mako's passing was, uh, was horrible, of course. You know, uh, Mako was an amazing actor. You know, number one, he was a great classical actor, and he brought this amazing, um, you know, sensibility to Aku. Uh, because he was classically trained, and Aku is such a ridiculous villain, it made this magical thing. So uh, we replaced him with Greg Baldwin. We uh, tried out a few people, and he really nailed it. And I knew, like, you know, I have the soul of Aku. Right. So I think with us working together, and there was obviously a lot of stuff that Mako did, um, and like a great story that I don't think has gotten out there yet was uh, when one of the recording sessions, Mako's daughter and grandson came to hear him. And when he was acting, uh, it was incredible. The daughter kind of shed a tear. Oh, that's so cute. And the grandson watched it and stuff, and they were so happy, and Greg, you know, I was like, no pressure. Right. And, uh, but just hearing the voice, there's a lot of good similarities. I mean, look, you know, of course, we're never gonna replace him 100%, but I think he did a really great job, and it's, you know, it was super hard to do. Um, should we get one from here? Yeah. Um, this is a long, it's the same question. I'm going to wait for the next question to come up. And um, Here's one. What's it like storyboarding for a huge, clunky studio production versus storyboarding? <laughs> <laughs> I told you it was long. For TV. I got it. What's it like storyboarding for TV versus a feature? Right. Okay. It's quite different. Uh, for... In this case, for Samurai Jack, it was myself and Brian Andrews and Dave Krentz did a storyboard. We did all the episodes. So it was really pretty much two people. And that was great because 
I love storyboarding, and I love telling the story especially. And Brian's been storyboarding since, uh, I think, The Blind Archers was his first storyboard with his brother. And, and it's great. And it's what it is. It's 100% creative freedom. Because I know Mike Lazo, who's my boss, our boss, is he has faith and trust. And he knows that I know Jack and I would never want it to go wrong. So right. as long as it made kind of sense and it's entertaining and all that kind of stuff is great. Feature storyboarding is rough. You have a gauntlet of stuff to get over, to get approved. And so any good idea that you have, it's a fight. It's a fight to get through and hopefully there's an idea left at the end of the day, right? But in, for Jack, I, you know, we came up with it, storyboarded it, and then now it's on the air. Perfect, perfect. Uh, hey Talia, uh, Gendy, what was the most challenging episode to make and why? The most challenging, um, well, the opening sequence was really hard because it was the first Jack that I boarded in 12 years. Right. You know, um, and funny enough, when we got married <laughs> on our honeymoon, I was storyboarding the first episode. Right. That was so romantic. <laughs> <laughs> So it's kind of, uh, it's pretty, actually it's kind of poetic that you're here, yeah. which is great. Full circle. Full circle. But so the opening was, the opening of the first episode was really difficult because I haven't done it in 12 years right. and jumping back into it. And I think the opening shot, I redrew it 10 times because I kept sending my sketches to Scott Wills, who's a production um, uh, designer. And seeing like, is this cool? Is this cool? Just waiting for a great reaction. And then I was like, what am I doing? Like, this is the shot. And then, of course, probably the hardest one beyond that was the, the very end. You know, whatever that is. But it was hard and emotional. They'll have to wait and see. Yeah. Have to wait and see. All right. Um, here we go. Chris, Christo, Gendy, do you see yourself producing any shows in 2D in the future? That's good. Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, it's no surprise to anybody that I love 2D. You know, I work in CG features because that's what they're making. And, you know, um, and I like it and I like CG, but there is still nothing that compares to a handcrafted, hand-drawn film. There's, yeah, you love that. I do love it, yeah. And, um, you know, there's something just about your drawing, good or bad, that then people watch and react. And uh, it's, there's nothing like it. You know, I used to be, you know, I'm like obviously like an animation geek, nerd, whatever, and I love that I can watch a Warner Brothers cartoon and I could see the different animators that drew Bugs Bunny different. And I go, oh, that's, you know, that's this guy and that's that guy. You could recognize all I could recognize styles. it, and I, and I love that, and I, the, I want to foster that more, because it's the personality of the artist coming through. Absolutely. That's good. All right, let me see. Um, okay, let's take that off. Let's do this one. Um, was there a definitive ending for the series in mind when the show started? No, there was not. It was, uh, you know, I got the concept down and I didn't know how many episodes we were going to do. Because in reality, you get green lit for the first season, mm -hmm. which was 13 back in the day. And so we were doing 13 half hours. And then somewhere around maybe nine or 10, they're like, you know what, we're going to do more. You know, and then you keep going, and so you never know what's gonna, when it's going to stop. But when I started, I mean, I knew we had to conclude it, but I never knew how until uh, a year after when, when I finished. The first episode? The first the episode? Last, after I finished the last episode, uh, I think like a, f a year after, I knew what I wanted to do. Okay. Um, all right. What is his name? You can just read the question. They'll, they'll know. This is a very look at this name. Ather Lentlessis. <laughs> you might be reading like, you know. <laughs> sorry, I'm so sorry I missed your name. Butt picker. <laughs> <laughs> you don't be careful. <laughs> there are there any hope of Samurai Jack living beyond season five? You never say never, right? Because this is Hollywood and who knows. And they're cartoons. You know. And they're cartoons, and, and so yeah, there always could be, but I think right now, in the state that I'm in, and the way we're finishing the story, I think it's an ending. And then, uh, you know, maybe if somebody wanted to pick, up, pick it up and find a different way in, then maybe that could be cool. You know, maybe an alternate timeline or who knows what. 
But for me, I want to really finish it on a tremendous high note where everybody's going to lose their crap and then, uh, and then get on to the next thing. Because who knows, what if the next thing that I want to do is just as exciting, maybe even more. So Maybe they'll like it more. Maybe you'll like it more. I mean, maybe give it a chance. Like it yeah. Okay, all right. Um, that's the same one. Um, Let's do a phone call. Oh, phone call. Let's do it. Hello? Hi, you're on. This is Gendy and Don. The Gendy and Don Show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Tank Man. Uh, I was calling. I was curious if Igor and Grichka Bogdanov had any role in the production of the new Samurai Jack episode. I didn't get Can that. Can you repeat on. your question? Uh, what, did Igor and Grichka Bogdanov play any role in the new production of Samurai Igor Jack? Igor and No. No. Oh, uh, they didn't? Zanuria BTFO. I think we have a bad connection. No, that's right. He just, it was a, whatever. All right. You want to take another call? Maybe it'll be a little better. <laughs> Do you have another phone call? Yeah. Here we go. You should turn the music, music down. Hi, my Hold on one second. Turn it off, yeah, because I can't hear. Go, Go ahead. ahead. Hi, it's Micah from New York. What's Jack's father's name? Uh, Emperor. <laughs> I'm not big on names because I feel like uh, you always get in trouble with names, and so uh, I wanted to, uh, we always call them Emperor. Okay. One more? Hello? Go ahead, you're on. There is going to be a season one, three, five. I'm sorry. All right, let's go to a question. We're gonna go. Here. We'll see if we can. Yeah. We'll come back to you. Yeah. Okay, Shogun of Sorrow. Why did the poison arrow in the birth of Aku catch fire? Why did the catch? Why did the poison uh -huh. arrow in the birth of Aku catch fire? Um. I think they're trying to stump you. <laughs> no, I remember doing it. I forget why I did it. It was 12 years ago. <laughs> He's going to come back to that. He's going to remember. I'll remember. Yeah, let's move on. Yeah. All right. Uh, Crow Zangaris. Is one of the daughters of Aku based on Alana's character concept? No, but I totally see where you're getting at. Because uh, Craig Kalman, who designed uh, the cult, the daughters of Aku, he drew seven different uh, hairstyles. And, um, all right, you guys haven't seen the episode, so that's, I don't want to give anything away. Uh, no, she's not. But the hair is similar, but, uh, but she's not. No. Okay. Okay, I'm so sorry if I messed your name up, but Ursus Tabison, Tabison, will there be an original soundtrack available for the show? We're actually working on it. We want to do some kind of a thing where maybe after the episode airs, uh, later on, it goes online, and you guys can buy the soundtrack or download the soundtrack or however way that goes. But we're working on it. All right. Here we have another one. This is a cool name. Just read the question. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's okay. When compared to 2D, Samurai Jack, and CG, Hotel Transylvania, um, what has been the biggest challenges you've had to overcome? Well, it's funny because when I started in CG, the biggest challenge was not treating it like 2D. Because I see, when I close my eyes and I see a scene, I see it two-dimensionally. I don't see it as a CG. And then when they would show me final lit scenes from the first Hotel T, I had no clue what I'm looking at. Because it, was, it just looks finished and something's wrong, but I don't know what. And then I realized, like, right. So what I used to do, I used to close my eyes and picture the CG as 2D, and then all of a sudden the mistakes or the, the focus and the changes uh, became apparent to me. And it was the weirdest thing. I had to regret back to 2D to figure out how to make the CG look better. It's like two different languages. Like it is, yeah. I mean, it's, it's for, and for, for me, that I've, my whole life, I've been looking at drawings and, uh, you know, and f that kind of animation and to see it rendered like that is kind of crazy. Well, 2D is coming back big time. Um, will this be the definitive ending or will we see more Jack in the we future? We got that, that already. So let's get back in line. See All right. Well, it's not. It's 
the same. Oh, here comes somebody. Big bad backstab. <laughs> Will Jack finally travel to the past? You really want to know that? <laughs> I mean, you want to know right now before you've even seen the first episode that he's going to go back to the past? I'm not going to answer that. Come on. Uh, okay. That's good. How do you feel about the current state about American animation? That's another question up there. Uh, Ian Bobin. Uh, I feel okay. I mean, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of great creative freedom to a degree, um, and there's a lot of different art styles. You know, sometimes they feel the same, sometimes they feel different. But I am an animation snob. I'm super critical about it, and I want my animation to be very specific onto what I love, just for me. I don't care about anybody else. <laughs> And so it's not where I want it to be. You know, I think there's, we're, we're kind of stagnant a little bit. And I feel like there could, be, there could be so much more. We could be pushing the medium to do different things. And I think, um, you know, there's definitely a lot of great creative shows. But, um, but yeah, that's how I feel about it. Okay. Um, you already answered that one. Okay. okay. Um, let me see. Oh, let's do, let's do a trial phone call. Okay. Is All the right. phone working? Let's see. <laughs> it sounds like they're underwater. All right. You're on. Hi. Hello. Hi. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. All right. I, am, um, I had a question. Did you guys, uh, where did you guys find the inspiration for the music? For the where music? Where did you find the inspiration? I used to, um, before the internet, I would go, so for, when I was starting Samurai Jack, I knew I wanted, I'm a, you know, because I'm an immigrant, I love ethnic music from all around the world. And uh, when I started the original series, I would go to Virgin Records, where they used to have a sampling bar. And you could go and listen to uh, different CDs back in the day uh, without having to buy them. And I would go to the world section, and I would just listen to these world DJs, uh, DJs, remix their uh, music from where they're from. And it was amazing. There was some amazing Arabian music, you know, Greek, Chinese, all over the world. And I thought, because Jack is going to travel around, the, around his world and meet all these different aliens, I really wanted each place to have its own ethnicity. Uh -huh. And then we mixed it with beats and electric music, and that's kind of where the music idea was born. And that's how you were, you were inspired by world music? Yes. World, like, DJ music. Right. Yeah. Because they would take an Arabian theme, like a, you know, some, and, uh, and remix it. And so it, was, it, def it felt new. Uh, and at the same time, had this history to it. You want to take another call? You guys want to do it? Let's try another call. I'm so nervous. <laughs> Don't, Don't be, be nervous. nervous. You're on. Hi there. Um, Hi. My name's Olivia. I'm from New York. Um, I was wondering um, about... If you guys were going to have any Easter eggs, like how you guys had Easter eggs in seasons one through four, like Quick Draw was in an episode or Townsville was in an episode, <laughs> I was wondering if you guys were going to have more Easter eggs in season five. Um, I think there's always something that sneaks in without even me being aware that we're doing it. Like the whole Townsville thing wasn't really, like we weren't, we weren't trying to do it. <laughs> I think it was still, we just came off of Powerpuff, so I think we were still semi-drawing some things like it, but um, in the new ones, uh, I mean, there's a lot of great surprises, I'll put it that way, that I think especially fans of the show will love, love will simply love, uh, and let's, I'll leave it at that. But yeah, that's kind of, I think, the only Easter eggs, but all my influences are seeped in somewhere throughout, so they're in there without me even knowing they're in there. Right. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Red Rock Run. What happened to the Guardian from season three? Yes. Do you not know who the Guardian is, honey? Uh -uh. Have you watched every single episode? <laughs> uh, every single one. <laughs> every one. I watched the first three the other night. You, uh, oh, you did, right? Uh -huh. Shh. I won't tell. I All promise. Right. Uh, the Guardian, we are going to, again, I don't want to give anything away, but I think we know the Guardian existed, and so we will try to address that. All right. Leave it at that. I can't see those questions up there. Yeah. I want to see what Master Chang has to say. 
Whose idea was it for the theme song? Whose idea was it for the theme song? It was, uh, oh, yeah. huh? was Will? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I wanted the theme song and I wanted this, uh, you know, the whole idea of the Samurai Jack music was very eclectic. And so I wanted this kind of cool hip hop, you know, instead of just classical, I wanted it to have an edge and, you know, mix hip hop with Japanese. And so Dawn, my wife, actually, um, knew Will I Am. Yeah. Back in the day. Way long time ago. Yeah. So we, and it was right before they exploded. Like, I think they were shooting the video for Let's Get It Started. Or was it just no, before that? No, I think that? they were. It was before that. They, they didn't explode all the way yet. It was just, like, he was, Black Eyed Peas were just starting to explode. Anyways, sorry. And, uh, <laughs> and we called him. And we called him. And he was actually a fan. Yes, of Dexter. Of, of Dexter. And so I came to his studio, and I pitched him the idea, and we talked about it. And then he came back with... Uh, three variations of an idea and uh and it's kind of a funny story i don't think i've ever talked about this I before love song. And, <laughs> yes. uh, the story was so he had a little studio in um uh, not in hollywood but in silver lake just above like some department not a department store but some kind of little mall area and i walked in and all the windows were curtained and stuff and we go into a little room and there were speakers. It was a tiny, like, closet room. And the speakers were huge, right? It was just, like, speakers and a desk and, like, a keyboard. <laughs> and, uh, and then he started to play the music. And it was so loud. Probably their, their they drums are probably, they can't hear anything. <laughs> but for my little sensitive, innocent ears, it was so loud. But at the same time, like, your whole, your whole body Feels shook it. from the bass. Uh-huh. And... Uh, and he played me the song, and I loved it right away. I, uh, you know, had a tiny little adjustment, and then that was it, and that became this theme song. And that's, so that's how it came to be. All right. Okay. That was a good question. That was a really good question. Thank you. <laughs> Brick Extreme. Well, oh, will there be the Scotsman? Yeah, he's back, of oh, course. Oh, he's so great. He's back, yes. Okay. Um, Ian Bobine. Sorry, like I said, sorry if I mess up your names. Um, what made you decide to stop making the series? I didn't, uh, so we were in the fourth season. Uh, we were in the fourth season and it was, um, I didn't know where it was heading. I didn't know, and what I mean by that, I didn't know if the network wanted more. I didn't know if I wanted to do more. It's, you know, it's a, it's a grind to do a show. It's awesome, I'm not complaining, but it's extremely difficult. And this show is hard, too, animation-wise. Yeah. It's very demanding. So anyway, so I felt the burnout. And so I didn't know, and I didn't want to shortchange the ending. And so I decided, well, the network's not asking me for it. I'm not sure if I want to do it just yet. And then Star Wars Clone Wars was starting out. Oh, right. And there was no way I was going to juggle both of those, because obviously the pressure on Star Wars was intense. And, and so I decided, well, maybe we'll do Clone Wars, and then maybe we'll come back. And then the network changed. All my bosses went away, and, um, and there was a new guard, and that was it. Then it kind of faded away, and in fact, I left the studio. You know? And I thought I was going to be at Cartoon Network pr pretty, much Forever. My, pretty much my whole life. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it was a great home. So, um, uh, anyways, and now you're back. But, well, kind of, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're back and finishing. Yeah. All right. Um, you want to take a call? Let's do a call. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. Oh my goodness. I love that all these girls um, are calling. <laughs> go ahead. Um. So, um, my question is, um, Aku spinoff win. Aku what? Aku what? Aku spinoff win. Oh, when's there going to be an Aku spinoff? <laughs> <laughs> hmm. I don't know. I'll think about it. It's a good idea. But uh, I don't know. He's got to make it through this whole battle. Is it Aku's ending or Jack's ending? That's an interesting point of view. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I feel like she's rooting for... She likes for, the bad guy. She's rooting for Aku. That's yeah. all right. That's okay. That's okay. Good question. Yeah. You want to do one more phone call? Uh, or maybe not. Yeah, let's go. You're on? Ooh. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. 
Hey, so my question was, how long did you study samurai culture before creating this series? So, in actuality, I was a fan of, uh, you know, samurai culture, samurai warriors, the Bushido Code, all that kind of stuff, since pretty much since I was 10. And, uh, and so I felt like I had a connection with it emotionally already before I started. And on top of it, since I was about that age, I would have this reoccurring dream where the world is wiped out <laughs> and uh, mutants, of course, survive or the mutants become from whatever this catastrophe was. I survived. I had a samurai sword and I would go to this girl's <laughs> house that I had a crush on <laughs> and I would pick her up and then we would uh, have adventures and, and survive. And uh, that obviously has a lot of similarities. I think you're Samurai with, Jack. With, with Jack. <laughs> And yeah, and of course, you know, like I read up more, uh, like I, I dived deeper in. Right. Uh, you know, I, I read The Art of the Sword, which is this amazing, um, there's this amazing book, a whole book dedicated to how a samurai takes his sword out. Wow. It was so amazing, uh, just all the, and it's more the mental details. than anything. It's like meditative and, you know, that's why sometimes two warriors can face off. And the way a guy takes his sword out, the other guy knows he lost. Wow. Yeah. It's interesting. It's really amazing. So anyway, so I did do some more research, more technical stuff and historic stuff. Uh, but I'm a, you know, I'm kind of a semi-historian about it. And so, and just a fan of it. So, you know, and I wasn't going to be like 100% accurate, obviously. It's kind of my own take. Right. You know, it's not like every Western that that was made in Italy is ex was exact. accurate to what was actually happening here. Westerns. So, you know, we, we can take some liberties. Um, Antoine Jackson, why does Jack have a beard? So we've kind of talked about it before you guys watched the first episode. Jack's lost. You know, it's been 50 years and he's lost his way. And so, you know, we want to support not just the mental idea of him being lost, but also physical. Right. So when you see him, you know, and this has been in the trailers and stuff, uh, he's in his armor, he's using weapons. And he's let his facial hair grow, you know. When we go he camping... He totally let himself... Oh, he, right. Camping Gendy. <laughs> <laughs> when we go camping, I grow a full beard because, like, I don't want to deal with it. I just want to just be there and be, be with nature and be free, you know. And I'm probably lost a little bit from... And I have to regain... You're actually totally not lost. I'm not lost. No. Actually, good. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, Jason... Um, L714, will you plan on making any more cartoons for Adult Swim after Jack? Yeah, I think we want to. This has been one of the best experiences that I've had. Sure. Uh, and so I want to. You know, I've been talking to Mike Lazo, who, run, you know, who's, um, runs. who runs it or whoever, you know, we work together. And so we've been talking about stuff, and I want to, and I want to see. I want to change the paradigm of television, though, the way it gets done. And I have some ideas about it, and, uh, you know, I want to take it to the next level. You know, I think... I think this season of Jack is going to blow people away. I mean, it's kind of blown me away. It's blown the people that I work with away, mm -hmm. you know, because we did it as a team. And I want to go to the next level, whatever that Creatively. is. Creatively. Creatively, storytelling-wise. I want to push, 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 and see where, where it comes to. Good I think we have question. time maybe for one more question. Yeah, or a couple more maybe. I don't know. Um, Gen uh, Gret, Gret, Gendy, what's the biggest inspiration for the cinematography? For the cinematography, I think the biggest inspiration is 70s filmmaking. You know, um, classic cinema dating before the 70s, Ben-Hur, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, the, the classic way to tell, a, to tell a story, to shoot a movie, to be cinematic. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I think the perfect example of it is like in Lawrence of Arabia where there's just a horizon of blue sky and sand and you see the camel come out. That's kind of where the core of it is. And so, and then 70s filmmaking, you know, in the 70s, things were raw, things were dirty, and, and, uh, and that's where I drew a lot of inspiration. I love to feel stuff viscerally, and I feel like the 70s films did that, you know. Um, but I think we got to wrap up. Uh, this was fun. I'm so excited that this day has finally come. And, uh, you know, I think you guys are going to watch it at 1030. And then, of course, at 11 o'clock, watch it again. Watch it on your DVR 15 more times. Who knows? Right now. And you're going to watch it. Right it's now. Next. It's coming up next. And 
Thank you. And uh, here we go. Thanks for watching us. Bye. I hope you enjoy it. <laughs>